Um, I just I made the mistake of checking Twitter just before starting, and I just read a tweet saying, uh, top conference tip, don't use the first person in, in your talk. Instead of saying, I will teach, say, you will learn, etc. I've already vi violated that, and I've just done it again and again, um, and I'm afraid I'm probably going to keep doing it. Uh, this is in some ways quite a personal talk, and the good thing is, if I keep saying I, then it means you don't have to feel any association with the code that you're going to see, which may be for the best. Um, if you don't, mean, don't know me, I'm John Skeet. Uh, I work for Google. I've worked there for about eight and a half years. For the last year and a half, I've been working on uh, the C Sharp support for Google Cloud Platform. It's awesome. Go check out our booth. Um, I've also been abusing C Sharp for a long, long time. Uh, I used to do this because I wasn't writing any production C Sharp, so it was fine to write awful, awful code that was kind of fun, uh, knowing it would never end up on a production server. Now I need to be slightly more careful that what I write will, you know, that I separate the abuse part from the uh, regular code. The idea is to look at interesting bits of the C Sharp language uh, which are ripe for being misused and misuse them ideally in a way that isn't just, well, this is crazy code, no one would ever want to do this, but do you know what, that actually looks quite appealing, but no, 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 definitely not. Um, I would like this to be a collaborative effort, so uh, in particular, you know, Kathleen knows the, the language at least as well as I do, um, and I'm sure some of you do as well, so if you suddenly spot other ways that we could abuse stuff um, you know, related to what I'm doing, do shout out, Likewise, if you're, or, or just come up on stage and start typing. Um, I've done it to other people, no reason people shouldn't do it to me. Um, likewise, if you don't understand what's going on, then it's possible you may actually learn something in this session. Uh, and there are at least a couple of bits of code that might be considered a bad idea or might be considered a good idea. And uh, I might ask for a show of hands. Um, but at least you need to think carefully before using, but they really are appealing. There are some more chairs scattered around on this side, by the way, so folks who are standing, um, it doesn't bother me if you walk in front of me. It's fine. Okay, uh, all the code is up on GitHub. I have a blog that's um, almost entirely about code. I have a non-code blog that's currently almost entirely about feminism. Um, and we have, I have, learnt that this talk is better if I work out what I'm going to teach you or show you beforehand. Uh, out of interest, this is called Abusing C Sharp more because I've done Abusing C Sharp as a talk with some of the older stuff several times. How many of you have already seen an Abusing C Sharp talk by me? Okay, not very many, so I might revisit some of the most fun bits of that um, just for a laugh. Um, and if not, there's far, far more code than I could possibly go over. So it's really sort of picking some fun things. We're going to start with the Mongolian vowel separator, which is my favorite Unicode character. How many of you were at Bill Wagner's talk about language design yesterday? A few. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, breaking changes and things that the language specification refers to. And I mentioned Unicode. And Bill was saying, well, that doesn't change much. Allow me to differ. So, we have a bit of code here. Most of this code, I will show you some code, we'll run it and see what it does, basically. Um, so, what do you think this code is going to do? Sorry, do you know what? I missed something. Sorry, there were... <laughs> I do want to call... Yeah. <laughs> It's annoying. I got a different version that had the show field call, but not the assignment. Right. OK, so now, more usefully, so I've got a little framework that is just going to call main. I'm just going to do the obvious thing. Any thoughts? It's going to write in main. OK. I will prove that you're actually correct, and then I'll show you why you might not have been. Yes, it prints in main. If I have run this, and someday I would love to try to find a version of uh, Visual Studio 2010, but with a Roslyn preview, running on, running on a version of Windows from about 2010. Um, because then, I think it would print in initializer. And those of you who are very close to the front, how many of you can read the line, column, and ch character thing on the, on the status bar? 
How many of you can see? OK, enough to see the numbers. So normally, focus on the col and ch as I just scroll around. So if I go to the left, right. As I go, I'm pressing, 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 pressing. So I had to press twice to go from the G to the X. And that's because the thing in the middle there is the Mongolian vowel separator. <laughs> it doesn't exist here. This just goes 28, 28, 29, 29, 30, 30. You yeah, know, it's all, it's all that. So we have a different sequence of Unicode characters here and here. But that's OK, because the language specification says that if there are any Unicode formatting characters within an identifier, that's fine, and they'll sort of be normalized away. In fact, it doesn't say that you'll normalize them. It'll say, when you compare, when you try to find an identifier, ignore them. And in fact, the, way that, the obvious way to do that is just by normalizing them away. Um, and so if you ask by reflection for string x, you will get the version without, um, without the uh, Mongolian vowel separator. So why does this mean in 2010 it would have printed something differently? Any Unicode, excuse me, um, trivia fans out there? Well, let me show you the history of the Mongolian vowel separator. It was introduced in Unicode 3.0, where it was introduced as a formatting character. And then in 4.0, it became a white space character. And it stayed a white space character until 2014. So if we'd been running on something Unico using Unicode 6, it would have been white space. Now, let's just replace the, Unicode, the Mongolian vowel separator with a regular white space. Now, that's still valid code, but it's going to print in initializer. Yeah? So as far as I don't know of any other characters that have gone from one Unicode category to another and then back again, um, and particularly to stay valid in identifiers but mean different things or other, either separate identifiers or, or be part of one. Um, so you might be wondering what the specification itself, itself says. And for every published version of the C-sharp specification, um, it's gone to, it, it's specified that it uses Unicode 3. And the, the old CSC.exe, the native one, used to carry alongside it, within it, a copy of Unicode 3. ECMA, there's an ECMA standard for C Sharp. The third edition covers C Sharp 2. Um, the fourth edition will cover C Sharp 5, when hopefully we get that out this this half, I really, really hope. And then the idea is that we can, between ECMA and Microsoft, we can get the uh, C Sharp 6 specification and standard out as sort of one thing. Um, so you'll have seen that there isn't a C Sharp 6 spec publicly available other than a draft version in a GitHub repository belonging to Lucian Vishik, who's no longer even in Microsoft. Um, but so ECMA said it had to be four. So if you tell the C Sharp compiler to run in ISO, uh, so ECMA is one standards body, ISO is a different standards body, but the ECMA standard was then fast-tracked to the ISO standard. So ISO 2 is equivalent to ECMA 3rd edition is somewhat equivalent to C Sharp um, 2. And I think this is still whoopsie, going to um, print If I can actually run the thing, come on. Control F5. There are build errors. Oh, OK, yeah. Half of the rest of the code in the project doesn't work under um, C Sharp 2. Uh, let's see if I pull up command prompt. Um, I can write it. The nice thing about compiling the code with main methods like this is I can compile just a single. Um, uh, file, so it's in odds and ends, and can anyone remember the command line that you use to specify the, the lang version? So if I do lang version ISO 2, Mongolian vowel separator, so 
it's shown in main still. Basically, this shows that the, uh, the compiler is not really obeying the language uh, choice that we've said, because that should mean use Unicode 4. As of Roslyn, Roslyn just uses whatever version of Unicode.net is using, um, because that's the only thing that really makes sense to keep going with. So in the uh, fifth version of the Unicode spec, sorry, the fourth edition, uh, which is C-sharp 5, the upcoming one, we're just waving our hands and kind of saying, it uses a version of Unicode, and let's hope it doesn't matter. Let's stick with strings a bit more and type n uh, use name of. So um, I'm going to add a class I should have added before. So name of intro. How many of you are using C Sharp 6? Good. And you're, you're aware of um, name of, hopefully. And I'll just rename into to intro, which is what I meant. So the next thing is if you come into that ever so common scenario where your shift key is broken. Or possibly you're working on a keyboard which uh, is in a different language and you don't know where the double quotes are. So you're unable to type a string literal. And this is a problem. Um, we often want string literals. And suppose you're in a slightly better situation that the, uh, the string literal that you want to write doesn't contain any spaces. You've got problems. Well, you can use name of to help you. So you could declare a method. So suppose we want to print uh, hello world all as one, one word. OK. We can do console.write line name of hello world. OK. So without typing any double quotes, we can now run that and uh, it will print hello world. But you know that kind of sucks, because you've got to introduce a whole extra method. And that's not fun. Um, you, could have, you could do a variable called hello world instead, and then uh, it's, it's still just a bit nasty. And then you think of dynamic. So one of the things you can do with name of is refer to instance or static methods, members, um, via a reference. So normally, if I do um, string x equals whatever, even null, um, I can't type x dot, uh, give me a static method on string, is null or empty. I can't use um, x dot is null or empty because it's a static method. And uh, C Sharp made the very good decision, unlike Java, that you shouldn't be able to call static methods on variables on any kind of reference, as if it's an instance method. What I can do is refer to the static method via an instance, I think. No. It's the other way around. You can refer to an instance. Yes, sorry. You can refer to an instance method. Um, I can do x dot split. I hope. No, it's because I haven't used name of. See, I hope that you would be on your toes. Yeah, and that now works. Good. Phew. Right. So even though is null or empty, you can't call as x dot is null or empty. You can use x dot to just say what type we're interested in. Great. So now that means I can write hello world without ever introducing anything in my program text that says hello world, introducing any kind of members. Because this syntax also works for dynamic. So we can write dynamic d is null and then do name of d dot hello world or d dot Mongolian vowel separator. And as you can imagine, d dot Mongolian vowel separator has the Mongolian vowel separator between the n and the v and then between the l and the capital S, so between the words. And as a bonus feature, not only is it allowing us to write that text, but it will also do Unicode normalization for us. So this is exactly the same. I'm copy-pasting copy into here. So you might expect that that length and that length will be the same. But actually, the length um, property on string is going to include the Mongolian vowel separator, whereas the version here 
is not going to be the same string because it doesn't include it. It's been normalized away. And we can see that if we do name of anything, we see that we get Mongolian val separator. We have a length of 23 without the MVSs and 25 with. So next time you're faced with a broken keyboard or you know, if, if Kathleen's up here and, and trying to find the, sh the uh, double quotes, you no longer need to worry about it. Just use name of on dynamic. See? Always useful stuff. OK. Uh, <laughs> um, just those next to Kathleen, she doesn't have anything like fruit or anything with her, does she? Just, OK. Mm. I may need to duck. Uh, Kathleen yesterday was saying about when not to use tuple deconstruction. Well, how about for dates and times? How would you deconstruct a date? So this is C-sharp 7 feature. You can um, write uh, var xyz equals foo if foo has a deconstruct method with three out parameters. And the trouble with dates is, you know, we like to think of it as day, month, year. And Kathleen probably likes to think of it as month, day, year. And we should really, you know, be open and inclusive of everyone. So really want, we want to be able to um, deconstruct using date time extensions and, you know, have x, y, and z. And who knows what x, y, and z will be? Maybe they will be year, month, day. Maybe they will be uh, month, day, year. Maybe they'll be day, month, year. So if we run this and run it the first time, it's doing day, month, year, which is you know, reasonably sensi sensible. Um, if I do uh, hash define US date format, uh, sorry, it was, it was month, day, year then, presumably. Um, and actually, I don't define it there. I define it in the extensions. So I can define, and it needs to be above the using directives again. Um, I can define that we want the uh, ISO date format, which is kind of useful instead of the US date format. But I can do US explicitly, 119. And if I do UK date format, then I don't need to change my calling code at all. I can put this one place in the project, and it will now do 19.1.2017. And that's just simple preprocessor thing. But what I do like about this is that I haven't changed my implementation at all. My deconstruct method, I've just changed the signature to have day, month, year, or month, day, year, or year, month, day. And then the body of the method, in every case, uses the same thing. Well, OK. that's. That's fine if you're happy to set the project, uh, do this define not here, but in the project properties. But what if in some source files, you, some of your source is written by UK developers, and some of it's written by US developers, and they both want to be able to you know, not write, you wouldn't actually write that. You would write whatever comes naturally to you. So I write uh, day, month, year. In fact, I write year, month, day, um, because I'm so used to the ISO format. And then in a different file, Kathleen might want to write month, day, year. Well, we've got her covered too. Because instead of having one implementation, we can have three different implementations, all still extension methods, just in different classes. And so long as we use using static and say which one we want to import, we'll get the right thing. So if we, this will do the ISO date format. So we'll end up with 2017, um, 119. Yes. And then, you know, if, if Kathleen were writing some code instead, we could use this. And she would then declare var um, month, day, year. And it would all do the right thing. So this allows you to uh, let developers from multiple cultures write perfectly nice code for themselves. And so long as only people from the same culture ever need to read or maintain that code, then everyone's happy. Um, don't do any of this. If I didn't make it really clear before, don't do any of it. Um, however, I do really like, I would recommend the using static as a way of importing extension methods. We have this in Node time. I have a testing assembly, which has a bunch of extension methods 
um, on int and double and things so that you can do, uh, this won't work here, but I'd be able to do uh, local date um, birthday equals 19.June 1976, which I wouldn't recommend in production code, but it's really clear when you're writing test code for, you know, maybe you've got some analyst or whatever has said, suppose the year starts, you know, the business year starts on April the 1st. Well, 1 April 2015 is really, really clear. Um, and I've got different ones for local date, or you know, another time I could write duration um, uh, session length equals one dot hours, for example. But I don't necessarily want both the hours extension method and the June extension method at the same time. And before C sharp seven, uh, sorry, before C sharp six, this was a problem because you imported the whole of all of the extension methods within one namespace in one go, just with using stuff. Now you can pick, I want the extension methods from that class, please, and that class, but not the one in the middle. Um, this is one of my beefs that I've been giving feedback to Microsoft on since 2005, and as of 2015, it's all good. Okay. Do shout if there's anything in the meantime that you want to uh, come up with, otherwise I'll just keep moving on to the next thing. So how many of you like regions? Hash region stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, I used to like it more than I do now. I sometimes use it if, if I've got a huge amount of code that's sort of all boilerplate stuff, that's quite handy, but I don't use it religiously all the time. Um, the trouble is it looks a bit boring, but the great thing is uh, with expression body members, we can get something that looks a little bit like that, but a bit more attractive just by declaring a property or a field. Well, a property. So um, ignore the, the implementation details for now, but look how we can write something that's a little bit like a region, okay, it's not gonna fold, but isn't that nice? We can highlight it as much as we like. We could you know, get rid of the middle bit, so long as we've got some balance. Actually, I'm not even sure that the balance is required, but we can you know, have a bit awesome code. You could use this for different levels of headings. It's great. Um, the, the name J here, I couldn't find anything any Unicode identifier that looks like a backwards semicolon, and we do need to have the semicolon. So if anyone f finds any Unicode characters that are valid in identifiers, um, and I could use as the variable name, that would be awesome. But so this is a, uh, a property of type J called underscore, which is a get-only property that uh, returns a well, it, it's got to return a J, and J is a delegate that itself returns a J when given a middle bit as the sort of fairly self-descriptive stuff that comes in the middle. Um, so we've got a lambda expression that itself returns a lambda expression, which returns, um, oh, we've got some strings here. Well, we've got to have been uh, given this. This will have to be middle bit in order to get the the lambda expression for j to work. So if this is a middle bit, we want to return a j given a less than or equal between a string and the middle bit. Well, okay, less than or equal between string and middle bit, we can do here, we've got operator overloading, uh, but then we also need to be able to convert from a middle bit to j um, and that's fine, we can just do an implicit conversion, and all of these do null, it's not actually gonna do anything. Um, and I can't remember offhand, oh yes, the reason I need the implicit conversion from a J to a middle bit is, well, that's going to be a middle bit, but then I need to compare that with another middle bit. It's possible that I could get away with uh, less than or equal between J and um, middle bit as well, but an implicit conversion is simpler. The one, you know, the one thing that you might want to complain about this code, and obviously the only thing, is that we have to include these um, greater than or equal to operators as well, and that's just the compiler won't let you do less than or equal to, but not greater than or equal to. Um, so you know, maybe that's the one thing that makes you decide not to use this code. Um, who can tell? Okay, uh, preprocessor oddities. This is a slightly old one, and this is not new to C Sharp at all, but it's just an interesting thing around the fact that C Sharp doesn't really have a preprocessor. So if you give 
the C preprocessor something, it sort of doesn't really care about the code. It just cares about your hash defines and your hash if, etc., etc. C sharp is a little bit different. So you can confuse things. I won't ask what you think this will show because um, actually Visual Studio is highlighting it already. But here we have, we're, we're defining foo up at the top, and then we're saying if foo. And so we're printing out foo is defined, and then we start a multi-line comment. And this is the interesting bit. The hash else, I believe in the C preprocessor, and someone will say I'm wrong, I believe in the C pro uh, preprocessor, that hash else would say, oh no, well, foo was defined, so I'll ignore everything from here onwards. The C sharp compiler is saying, no, you're in a multi-line comment. It's the, the parser, really, Lexa. Um, you're in a, a multi-line comment, so that hash else is just part of the multi-line comment. That's absolutely fine. So we'll keep going, and this is all part of the comment, and the comment ends with this, with this star slash. And at that point, we're out of the comment, so this else means the preprocessor is saying, oh, I'll just ignore everything else. Fine. So we just print foo is defined. If we don't define foo, let's define foo2 instead, suddenly, okay, we don't see this, and we don't see the start of the comment. You can write whatever you like in stuff that's ignored by the preprocessor. So it doesn't care about the start of a comment. So it sees this else as the bit that it should start caring about. And now we print foo is not defined. And now this little bit here, that the second half of this was the end comment when foo was defined, it's now the beginning of a multi-line comment because foo isn't defined. So now we're in a multi-line comment again, and this hash else that was useful before is now in a comment. And we just have this comment, and we end it. And I suspect, I suspect I could probably take that away and the whole thing would keep working either way, but it's kind of more symmetric as it is. So this will print foo is not defined twice. Can anyone think of a similar feature we could use to demonstrate something kind of the same, although it'll have a little bit more effect on the output? What else might start consuming that hash else not as a preprocessor hash else. Uh, ooh, sort of. Elaborate. So if I leave off the end here, it's just going to say, well, that's an unterminated string literal. Multi-line strings, yes, verbatim string literals. So this is largely similar. Here we have foo is defined. So we're going to get a verbatim string literal, that's the at there, which says foo is defined, and then the string contains hash else, and it also contains string x equals at. And then this double quote here is the end of the, str the verbatim string literal. So this will print foo is defined, else string equals at. If we don't define foo, or define foo too, now, this isn't the end of the previous string literal, it's the start of a new verbatim string literal. And now this else is consumed, and now we've got foo is not defined. And this is one of those things that, no, it doesn't actually have any, I can't pretend it could be useful in any way, shape, or form, but it is quite fun. Um, I'll give another one of those that I haven't presented before, so feedback welcome. Um, something I wasn't aware you could do before, which was to use attributes on type parameters. Has anyone ever seen, and this is actually a, a use that maybe with a Rosin analyzer, which you know is to do, um, you could have. So foo is a generic type, and its type parameter, the type parameter itself has an attribute of must be immutable. And you can imagine writing a Rosin analyzer saying, everywhere I see a foo of t, or you know, a foo of something, I will validate that either that's a, a foo of t in a generic method or type where the t also has must be immutable, or if it's a concrete type argument, I'll check that it has the immutable attribute. So here in, in our usage code, we've got um, bar is a class which is immutable, 
Baz is a class which isn't, and we would like this to be fine and that not to be fine. And sure, we can't change the actual compiler rules to say C sharp says it's wrong, but we could fairly easily, and I, well, fairly easily. Um, writing Roslyn analyzers is not easy, but it's feasible. Um, I, I think it would be entirely feasible to write an analyzer so that it would come up with an error here, and that could be actually useful. But I'm intrigued, has anyone else seen the, the bit of syntax, to be clear? This is the syntax that is surprising to me. Anyone see? You have? Right. What was it used for? Ah. Right. Uh, in CoreFX Labs, it's used for is primitive, um, so, that, so that it could check endianness. Was that? Ah, right. Okay. So, so it could cope with network to host order or host to network order, depending on the native endianness. Cool. Um, if anyone sees any. Uh, any uses in the wild beyond that, please email me because I would love to collect them somewhere. Uh, you could, right, so yes, you could do it for enums or delegates um, instead for unconstrained melody type things, yes. Yeah, that would be quite a cool thing. Um, IntelliSense won't help you there, but yeah, meh. Um, yeah, that would be a nice way of doing things. Cool, let me know if you find anything else. Uh, let me just shut some windows down. I think we're dealing with string interpolation next. Yes, we are. Right. So, have you all used string interpolation in C Sharp 6? Are you all aware that it uses the current culture by default? So if you're logging, use invariant culture. I'll come back to logging. Um, so, lambda expressions. The expression in an interpolated string literal has to be an expression. Okay, so you can't do this. This is meant to be, well, I'm opening the bit that's meant to be uh, the interpolated part, and then, oh, I'll just have a, a, a block here and do stuff in the block. Now, that's not allowed. That's not an expression. Lambda expressions are expressions, but they don't have a type. So you can't just write, you know, uh, I can do lambda so I can't do console dot right line um, and then just goes to y yeah won't work okay that's not going to pass because the lambda expression has no type uh, so it can't convert it to anything but you can cast a lambda expression to a delegate type. Um, and then you can just use it on its own. So if I, let me just comment everything else out here. The hideousness we'll see later. So if we just have a lambda expression, uh, thank you. Uh, Okay, so this now compiles, I believe, and we've got the lambda expression. We've got that in brackets uh, because precedence. And then we've got a cast. I suppose I could do it probably. I don't think I've ever tried to get away from casting by just using as. Is that going to work? No, I think I think you'd still need the uh, the brackets, and even then, okay, as operator isn't as powerful as cast. Fine. Um, bom, bom, bom. Right. Okay. So this is now converting it to a funk of string, and this is just going to print. Uh, what am I on? I'm on the wrong project. String interpolation. I'm doing lambda expression. Okay, so that's just printing. Oh, it's a func of string. Well, once we've got a func of string, we know how to invoke it. So we can just add a couple of brackets. We can, let's make it a little bit more readable by calling invoke instead. And so now, when we evaluate the string, um, 
as in when at execution time it evaluates this argument, it will create the delegate and then immediately invoke it, which will print hello and then return y. Great. We can then, if we want to avoid the cast, if you know, you're doing this regularly in code for some bizarre reason, um, you can just write a method. And in this case, uh, I have got it in the same class, but you could write it somewhere else and import static. So using static it so that you, know, you could use it everywhere. And then you just need to pass in the um, lambda expression. That will do exactly the same thing. But you can, if you can stomach the brackets, you can do a whole program in our interpolated string literal. So when we run this, well, let, let's just run it and then have a look at the code. So, ah, what's your name? John. Hello, John. So the order of execution here is it. We have console.writeline starting with hello, but before we can get into the console.writeline um, uh, evaluation, uh, sorry, invocation, we have to evaluate this string. And this string, which is a verbatim interpolate, sorry, interpolated verbatim string literal, is going to need to create this delegate and then invoke it. And the delegate will print something else to the console, then ask our name. And then we're returning the name so that that can be appended onto hello. And that's what ends up being called to console.writeline. So I think you can see this can radically simplify your code. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Oh, crikey. Uh, we'll, let's noodle on that later on. I think we can definitely come up with something nastier. Um, yeah. Uh, but yes, I think uh, trying to do that now is going to fail. Um, but there are other things we can do with uh, string interpolation which are fun. So normally, with regular string interpolation, even if we use formatable string, and this is the bit that you might learn something more, uh, how many of you have used or seen formatable string? OK, right. Brief diversion. So the type of an interpolated string literal is string. Formatable string is a type introduced in .NET 4.6 and .NET Standard 1.3. There is no conversion from string, the type, to formatable string, but there is an implicit conversion from an interpolated string literal expression to formatable string. If that sounds crazy, it isn't. You've seen this before. If I do var x equals 10, the type of x is int. The type of the integer literal there is int. I cannot do byte y equals x. That won't compile because there's no implicit conversion from int to byte. But I can do byte y equals 10 because there is an implicit conversion from a constant expression of an integer type where the constant value is within the range of byte to byte. Okay, So it's worth getting in your head the, the difference between a conversion from a type to another type or a conversion from an expression to another type. And you also get that with lambda expressions. They have no type, so there has to be an implicit conversion from a lambda expression to some other type, or you could never use them. But it is a slightly subtle difference. And dynamic has conversions one way but not the other. It's really bizarre. So the point of formatable string, the, the real usage of formatable strings is to be able to perform the string formatting in whatever culture you want. That's the intended use. So obviously, we're not going to bother doing that. We'll do more interesting stuff instead. When you use a conversion from a string, an interpolated string literal to formatable string, um, it works out what it would do in terms of what's the format string that it's going to call string.format with. So that ends up being that, you know, the regular braces with numbers in. Um, and it evaluates 
value in this case. And it does that once and creates an instance of formatable string that's got the format string and the arguments as values. So that's evaluated once. And then when you call formatable.toString, it says, OK, I will call string.format um, you know, with whatever culture you specify, if you're specifying one, um, and pass in the values that I evaluated before. And it does that evaluation once in the conversion. So here, unlike, for example, with link, where if you had a link query, imagine something like this, but as a link query, um, changing value, if value were captured within your link query, changing the value of value would change the results of the query. Here, if I run this regular evaluation, it's going to print before twice, and then the bit of code that's counting here well, our formatable string is just, oh, get date time dot net at UTC now. That's evaluated once and then retained. Wouldn't it be nice if we could evaluate things kind of lazily instead, at the point of formatting, instead of at the point of constructing the formatable string? Well, we can sort of with a bit of work. So this is very similar code to what you saw before, except for this chunk. OK, so fairly obviously, this is a Lambda expression. And we have um, a method that accepts a funk of object and returns whatever I called it, captured capture. So it remembers not, well, it, it is evaluating it once, and it evaluates to a single delegate. But the good thing is we've now got a delegate, and we can invoke that delegate as many times as we like. And in particular, we can implement iFormatable, which means that when string.format gets called, we'll end up in here. And at that point, we can then just call um, our delegate. So we can evaluate it every time we're formatted. We can reevaluate the delegate, and if we've been given uh, if, if it returns a value which is also formatable, then we can pass on the format string to that. So, for example, in this datetime.now, I've specified that I just want to give the hour, minute, second, um, and down to millisecond. So if we run this code instead, even though, just to be really clear, all we're doing is printing formatable 10 times, every time we print it, uh, there we go, it's printing a different time. Let's take a formatable string one step further. How many of you know about SQL injection hacks? Anyone who didn't put their hand up, the first thing they do after this session, or you're allowed to leave now, is you write up, uh, you go and read um, bobbytables.com or just search for SQL injection attacks. Um, and never, ever write SQL that looks like this. OK, let's get rid of that for the moment. Um, but none of you, oh, sorry. None of you would ever write code like that, right? It's clearly going to be broken. Well, you know, you might think that you need apostrophes around the name. ID is an integer, so that's fine. Um, but that's clearly going to break if, if name has any apostrophes in. This is the one that uh, I'm saying you can use this if you want. It is justifiably nice, um, but there are some downsides to think about. But they're not SQL injection with this code. So I assert that this is safe code. We're not calling new SQL command. We're calling new SQL command. So we're not calling the SQL command constructor. We're calling this extension method that I've created on uh, SQL connection. So far, so good. And that doesn't accept a string. It accepts a formatable string. But the interesting thing is what it does with that formatable string. I'm going to sort of ruin the surprise and, and show you the results now. So um, when we run it, I'm not going to talk to an actual database, of course. Um, instead, I'm going to print the command text and then there are two parameters, and I'll print their names and their values. 
Uh, so parameterized SQL. OK. Does that look much more like something that you would want to evaluate? You know, if you're not using Entity Framework or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's now a perfectly reasonable way of doing the query. And the good news is you didn't have to write command.parameters.add p0 and make sure that the p0 was the same as you put in the SQL itself. You never put p0 anywhere in your code. How many people are interested in the token p0 and want that to appear in their source code? No one. You know, it's, it's just an artifact of I want to link this bit here to this parameter over here. So in order to do this, now you've seen the results, how do we do it? So we have our new SQL command method that takes a formatable string. There are two bits in formatable string. There's the format, which I've carefully documented will be this. Um, sorry, I didn't put the mvarchar back in up here. Okay. So, uh, yep, there's the format. And then you can call get arguments, which will return you an object array with the arguments in, which in our case are going to be the name and the ID. Great. So first bit is pretty simple. We can take, that, uh, take the arguments and convert just the arguments into SQL parameters wrapping those arguments. And we'll use the overload of select that accepts the position as well. And we'll use that to name our um, parameters. So we end up with P0, P1, P2, etc. And we can specify the value there as well. That leaves two things. We need to get the SQL itself correct. And we need to handle types so that you can specify what you want the SQL DB type to be. Well, both of these are done with format capturing parameter. So we're, we're taking our SQL parameters. So we've got P0, Cori, P1, 10. And wrapping each of those in a format capturing parameter. So it's a uh, parameter that captures formats. And then all we're doing then is using those as the actual arguments to string.format. So the, clearly, the interesting bit is going to be what happens when you format one of these uh, format capturing parameters. So format capturing parameter, in turn, remembers the SQL parameter it's wrapping. And then it does two things when to string is called. The first is so that we get the command text right. It's just returning the name of the parameter. So where we had the placeholder in the original interpolated string literal, that's where we want the at p0. Yes? Great. So that's what the final bit of code is. But also, as a side effect, and you know, never, ever, ever make formatting a string have side effects. But in this case, it's kind of useful. Um, so we're going to see whether we've got a, the bit to the right of the colon that says how to format the value. And we're saying that, if you like, the format of the first parameter is that it's an nvar char. So all we need to use is um, enum.parse, and we'll say, oh, we don't care about casing. Um, so we could do int here, and this will use, um, or let's use text instead, I think. And now, uh, if we run this again, instead of saying nvar char, it will say the type is text. It's come up with SQL DB type dot text. So out of interest, I, I'll give you the downsides now. So the upside is this looks cleaner. Ignore the, the diagnostic stuff. This is all you need to do to end up with a SQL command that has all the parameters. And you can see where the parameters are. You won't get any of those cases where you've added the same parameter with two different names. Or you, know, you need to look back from the SQL to the parameter filling code. You've got them all in the right place. That's the good bit. The bad bit is you hire a new developer who may be new to C Sharp. They see this, and they think, that's the way that I'll do SQL. New SQL command, connection, that, and suddenly, bang, SQL injection attack. Or likewise, you, have, you run some static tool analysis that says, that looks awfully like a SQL string that you're using string interpolation for. I'm going to complain at you. So, if you're not using the static tools 
and you're quite capable of explaining to every member of your team how this works, I think this could be a win. How many people do like this? A few, and how many really don't? A smaller number really don't, okay. And the rest of you are sort of, oh, I'm not entirely sure. Did everyone follow the explanation? You should never, ever use this code if you don't understand it. Okay, definitely. Um, but this is you know, potentially useful code. I see I've only got 10 minutes left. I've gone through about maybe 15% of the code within this solution. Um, so go and have a look on GitHub later. Let me see what we'll do. Uh, are any of the rest really, really fun compared with? No, let's do some Link. Everyone like Link? Yeah? Um, I like Link as well. But the one thing I don't like about it is it's so verbose. You have to write so much code to do anything. Um, you know, take select, for instance. That's six characters I'm never going to get back from my life. <laughs> um, so I think we, we've got other ways that we can write link queries. We just need to you know, write the frameworks for them. So let's, there's a, an intro somewhere, basic demo. So I was looking at some operators. Um, I've got the evil method. I might rename that to two link to operators at some point. That just takes any I enumerable and then lets us work with link to operators. So here we have, you know, ampersand. It's a bit like bitwise operands. It, uh, bitwise evaluation. It's always going to shrink things. So it's very much like a filter. That's going to do our where for us. And then we think of link as a pipeline. You know, we we massage things. The shape of the pipe changes. So the pipe operator is going to be our select. So let's just look through what this is going to do. Um, so we start off with, hello world, how are you? Sorry, get rid of the tooltip. And then we'll take away from that sequence the world. So clearly that leaves, hello, how are you? And then we'll concatenate today. Notice how already this is so much simpler than it would have been in, in um, linked to object. Yeah. Um, then we'll filter it. You, know, you may not be terribly used to seeing lambda expressions as operands, but hey, it works. Um, you do need the, the uh, brackets. I think it won't compile then. Um, precedence, again, gets completely confused. Um, so we'll convert it. Uh, we'll filter out anything that's shorter than five characters. So we end up with uh, hello, how are you? Sorry, hello today. And then we'll convert each of those to uppercase. And I'm no longer thinking about culture infos and whatever, so I don't care that it uses the current culture. So I will print that query three times. You know, why not multiply a sequence by a number? That's clearly just going to be hello today, hello today, hello today. Um, and the other example in this basic demo is XOR. So XOR for two sequences is fairly obvious. Um, it's just going to be things that are in one sequence or the other sequence, but not both. So this should print uh, foo, baz, quux. So we should end up with hello today, hello today, hello today, foo, baz, quux. Basic demo. Hooray. So that's some of the operators. And I will go into a couple of my favorites in a minute. But do any of you have favorite operators? Dear me. No favorite Unicode character, no favorite operator. Joe, yeah, I tried to adopt the Mongolian vowel separator um, because they're, they're running a scheme where you can pay 50 bucks or something to adopt a character. They don't let you adopt formatting characters. It's most sad. Um, one day, the Mongolian vowel separator will have a certificate on my wall. Um, so I, I've overloaded everything you can overload as of C-sharp 6. I haven't yet tried to overload the is operator, which I didn't know about until Kathleen told me about it yesterday. Um, was it you or was it Bill? It was you, wasn't it? Ah, yeah. Um, so uh, there's still that to go, but I've overloaded everything else. Let's have a look at division. Um, before I switch to the code, when it might be a little bit more obvious, what do you think it means to divide a sequence by something? Sorry? Difference between them? Well, that's more subtract. It's a different thing you could do with subtraction. Split. OK, what kind of split are we talking about? Give us an example. Uh, 
Right, OK. Uh, so take a collection of length 6 and divide it by 3, and you get collections uh, each with, either each with 3 or dividing it into 3 collections. That's one way of doing it. Um, and that's one thing I've implemented. So that's the second part here, where if we divide our sequence of each of the words I'm splitting at the end of this very long line, um, I'm calling split. So we've got a bunch of words from Hamlet, and then we're dividing them by five. And I've chosen to make that mean divide them into groups of uh, sequences of five. And that nicely means that the remainder operator is clearly, you know, we won't give you a batch of less than five words. And the remainder operator will give you whatever was left over after that division. Great. Um, I'm more fond of dividing by a function. So let's start off with our little company where people are in different departments. And if I said to someone non-techy at all, uh, here's a bunch of people in a company, uh, could you divide them by department? They would naturally just group them into, you know, well, all the people from accounting over here, all the people from sales over here. So we can do exactly that. So we can take the employees and divide them by a lambda expression that shows the department. I'll just show you that. Uh, division. So it's too much stuff. So we've got accounting has Dave, sales has Bill and Betty, etc. And our dividing by an integer, um, the double commas here are where there was a comma in the original text. So we've got five words here, to be or not to. Then B, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the etc. Um, I think Shakespeare would be a lot duller if you read it always in sections of five words. It wouldn't quite have the same zing. Um, I'll show you my other favorite. Uh, this is the, the operator dedicated to Eric Lippert. Um, Eric made a foolish statement one time. He said that the unary plus operator is kind of pointless. It's only there for symmetry. Um, what other use could it possibly have? Uh, it's there so that you can write plus 5, you know, var x equals plus 5, and that still work, because that's symmetric with minus 5. I say there are interesting other things you can do with it. Before I get on to unary plus, though, what about unary minus? What does it mean if I have a sequence? What does minus sequence mean, just on its own? Not foo minus sequence, just you know, var new sequence equals minus sequence. What would you like it to do? Reversing. Someone said reversing. OK. Anything else it could do? Lowercase. Lower OK. I haven't implemented that, but I'll hear that as the equivalent of sort of negating element-wise, which is you know, if, if you view negating a capital letter to a lowercase letter, if you start with numbers instead, you could have negative numbers. When I asked on Twitter, someone else suggested it could pop the sequence. So the return value could be the first element of the sequence. But in evaluating it, you could also modify the sequence that you called it on and remove that first element. Um, again, never, ever, ever do that. Operators should not modify anything. Um, however, we can. There's nothing to stop us from doing it. So let's do it. Um, I should show you that some of the code for this, by the way, is in operator enumerable. It's mostly very simple. So you know, if we have plus, we can use all our normal um, operators, uh, all the normal link operators, and I have. Everything's kind of dynamic, um, but the implementation is a lot less sort of fun because it's fairly trivial. Um, it's a lot less fun than the uh, things you do with it. So we had three different things we could do with the unary minus operator. And this is where the unary plus operator comes in. I've implemented the unary plus operator as a sort of mode selector. So if you just do minus sequence, I believe it reverses it. Yes. So minus sequence is the reverse of sequence. But then if we use plus sequence to mean the same sequence, just with a different meaning for unary minus. So it goes on and it, go, it cycles round. So you can go from reverse to negate each individual item to popping mode, which is the craziest mode. So if we print minus sequence, here we'll get the reverse. So these are the first seven digits of pi. So reverse will get 2951413. If we do minus plus sequence, we'll end up with 
Um, just minus 3, minus 1, minus 4, minus 1, minus 5, minus 9, minus 2. And of course, we can um, combine these. So minus sequence, we've seen, is the reverse one, starting with 2. Plus minus sequence is the reverse one, starting with 2, but in a different mode. And minus plus minus sequence is the uh, reversed and negated. So it's minus 2, minus 9, minus 5, etc. If we want to get into popping mode, uh, the plus plus operator is clearly entirely different from plus plus. That I can't remember what it does, but it's you know it's bound to do something different. Um, so we have to have this this annoying space in there. Of course, if the Mongolian vowel separator were still being deemed a space, I could put that in there, so you would uh, find it hard to tell the difference between that and plus plus. Um, oh, for those halcyon days. Um, and then if we print popping three times we end up with 3, then 1, then 4. And then if we print just popping, instead of minus popping, sorry, um, it will print 1592. And then just to prove that it does indeed cycle, if we do plus, plus, plus sequence, and then negate the result, uh, we'll go back to just reversing. So let's run that. Yeah, we're, we're, that result is the same as the straight reversing. Um, as I say, I've got all the other operators there. So the, the tilde operator looks like a bit of a wavy line to me. Who knows exactly what it's going to do? So it shuffles the elements. It just shuffles the sequence. Um, there are other things, powers, and all kinds of stuff. Please go and investigate on GitHub. Um, unless I've completely misread my timing, I'm now out of time. Uh, come and see me for any questions about details. Have a look on GitHub. Uh, I haven't written explanations for any of it, um, but hopefully you can get a, a feeling of it, um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't use any of it. Thank you. Thank you.